morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's been uh, five weeks for me now in Dubai, and I continue to get surprised uh, and mesmerized by the galaxy of business leaders, Indian business leaders uh, who are there in UAE, and how bonded together they are that in all these kind of events, they come together. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's simply outstanding, and I, I, I'm sure that I will really uh, keep loving that uh, for the three years that hopefully I'll be here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to attend this function to celebrate and recognize uh, the top Indian leaders in the Arab world. And I would like to thank uh, Forbes Middle East uh, for inviting me and also for the fact that they are doing this for the fifth year running now, which shows uh, both the commitment of Forbes Middle East uh, as also the depth of Indian talent uh, and the depth of Indian contribution uh, in UAE and in the Gulf. Well, India and the Arab civilization has always been uh, at the forefront of human progress. And over the centuries, our people have remained connected through our seas and our lands. Our traders, scholars, monks, artists have exchanged goods and knowledge throughout the millennia. And much before our countries acquired the political formations that we today see. The Arab merchants came to India for spices and for ornaments, and our traders sought new markets and friendships in this region. For the past several decades, this exchange between India and the Arab world has intensified further, especially with the contributions made by Indian businessmen and workers in the Gulf. We, don't, we need to remind ourselves that today Indians make up the largest expat community in the GCC countries, and over 7 million Indians reside in this region, contributing to the economies of the host countries, not only as big business conglomerates, but also as uh, top-notch professionals, as well as workers on construction sites, in hotels, in restaurants, and even in government departments. Government of India is proud that Indians are not only contributing to the economies of these countries, but have also set an example of a community that is law-abiding, committed, hardworking, and talented, and one that wishes to give back both to the country which are hosting them, as well as uh, to India back home, and also contributing to the local communities uh, wherever in the Gulf uh, they are or in the Arab world. We should also always thank the governments of these countries for giving the opportunity to Indians to work and succeed in their countries. In this context, I would especially like to thank uh, the government of UAE and the rulers of Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and other, other Emirates. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, government of India under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, has paid special attention to India's ties with the Arab world. There have been regular exchange of high-level visits uh, between India and the Arab countries, especially uh, with the GCC countries. The Arab world is collectively India's largest trading partner, and we have a two-way trade of nearly $180, million, $180 billion. India sources 60% of its oil and gas requirements from West Asia, and we have substantial common interests in the areas of trade and investment, energy and security, culture, diaspora, and also on issues like terrorism as to how to defeat a common challenge of terrorism that all our countries face. Now, as the Consulate General of India to Dubai, I would especially like to mention the landmark and historic visits of Prime Minister Modi to UAE in 2015, and that of Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, to India in January this year as the guest, our guest at Republic Day. As a result of these visits, relations between India and UAE have today reached great heights, and building upon the historic 
people-to-people -people contacts, and the traditional areas of our cooperation, we are today looking at newer areas of collaboration. For example, India is looking forward to UAE's partnership and investment in various infrastructure sectors in India. We are also working together in cutting-edge technological areas such as space, renewable energy, and IT. And I'm sure that this cooperation will continue to strengthen in the years to come. We are also seeking UAE's partnership in taking forward the flagship schemes of Government of India, such as Smart Cities, Make in India, Digital India, and Startup India. And this is where I would urge the Indian leaders, the Indian business leaders who are all here today, to also look at these schemes and see how you could also contribute to these flagship schemes of Government of India and contribute in a very concrete manner to the development of the country. In the same vein, later this month on May 23, we are organizing a Startup India Summit in Dubai to showcase several Indian startup companies in Dubai. We have also started work on our participation in Dubai Expo 2020, uh, in which again I'm sure several of your business leaders will be interested. I've joined as the Consul General of India very recently, so I'm discovering the Indians who have made a big mark in UAE and the Arab world. And the range of areas in which Indians have been successful is simply astonishing. And I'm sure that we will see that uh, tonight as well. So you have Indian business leaders in retail, in healthcare, in hospitality, education, banking, media, real estate, and several other areas. And I'm sure in the years to come, in cutting edge technology areas, several of the business leaders, especially the young leaders, uh, which again seem to be focus, one of the focus for this night, uh, they will make their mark in, uh, in the Arab world with the focus of Dubai and UAE on innovation and the way India is progressing uh, and India's strengths in the areas of high technology. The stories of risk-taking, entrepreneurship, courage, and leadership of all you business leaders who are here today are equally breathtaking and worth emulating. I've, made, I've met several of you, and everyone has a unique story to tell. Someone who came six decades back and have made marks in the area of retail, for example, or someone who has come only three decades back and is a really big businessman now. All this shows the quality of hard work, entrepreneurship that the Indians have and is worth emulating, especially for, for young leaders who are here today. So sometimes it looks a bit too simple and I also start thinking whether I should also have done that, but perhaps not. And it's difficult, maybe I'm too old now, and it's difficult to leave the job of a diplomat in any case. So today's evening is a celebration of all these highly successful business leaders uh, from India. And I would once again like to thank uh, Forbes Middle East for organizing this event for the fifth successive year and uh, for inviting me uh, to deliver this speech. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be with you guys uh, this evening. A welcome to all of you. Uh, and congratulations to all of you. It's always an honor to meet you guys. Uh, you know, what's great about you guys is that you guys, most of you guys have made these empires out of nothing, starting your businesses from literally scratch. And, and you know, when you're at an evening like this, there are many questions that come to your mind, at least to my mind. What is it that you guys did that was, that was something that the others couldn't do? What were defining moments of your life? What are things that we can probably learn from you? I know, I know there are lots of them that we can. So there's so many questions that come to mind, right? And here in this room, there's not only the first generation that set up business and created these empires. There's also people from the next generation. And I, I have this um, very funny thing that comes to my mind when I talk about the next generation. So um, the next generation guys who are here, does any of you know that all of you have nicknames. Anybody knows what they are? Adil, do you have any idea what your nickname is? 
everybody who belongs to the next generation here of these business empires, you're called something outside. You know what that is? Lucky. <laughs> okay, guys, so there are so many questions. And, and you know, when you want answers, I think the best thing to do is ask those questions. And that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. We're going to ask questions to some of our leaders present here. We're going to bring in the next generation as well. So I'd like you guys to please join me in welcoming Mr. Ram Baksani, the president of the Global ITL Group. Mr. Bharat Bhatia, CEO, Konaris. Mr. Yogesh Mehta, MD of Petrochem Middle East. If you could please have you guys on stage. Come on, guys, give them a huge round of applause. And also, of course, we got to call the lucky guys. So may I call on stage Adil Sajan, director of Danube Group, and Ruchi Dhana, CEO of Dana Group. If you could please join us on stage. So thank you very much, uh, lady and gentlemen, for joining us on stage. But I'm going to start with uh, you, Mr. Baksani. It's a very interesting story. We all know your story. I've read your book. Uh, but you've got to tell me this. You came here in the 60s. I came here, came here in the year 1959. 59. All right. You've got to tell me one thing. At that time, there was not much in Dubai to find. What did you find? What did I find? Yeah. I found Dubai. <laughs> That's well said. Well, there was no water, no, there was no electricity, there was no airport, and there was not even a single car in Dubai, there was not any road. And uh, you may ask me, then why did you come here? I came here to make my living, which I am still continuing to do. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm still going to ask you one more question, right? So I came here in 2002. So when I told my mom and, and my parents that I'm going to Dubai, and believe you me, I'm not lying, this is true. When I told my parents I'm going to Dubai, uh, my mom was okay, my dad was okay, my grandmom was like, Dubai? Pagal ho gaya kya? I want to know what your family said when you're going to Dubai. Yes, my brother who was living in Hong Kong, he got mad on me. Because my mother did not object to, but my definitely brother who lived in Hong Kong, he said, kabhi thuna hai, Dubai kidar hai? <laughs> Fantastic. Mr. Bharat Bhatia, I'm going to move on uh, to you. Now, you started your own journey from being a salesman in the 80s. You've got to tell us how does one even start this journey? Where did you start from? Well, I arrived definitely in 1983, uh, joined as a small company. But I was blessed that my, my parents were well-to-do, but I, to be honest with you, in front of everyone, I'll tell you I was a very die-hard fan of Amitabh Bachchan. And I wanted to make my own money. And when I said, my dad, I want to go to Dubai, and I honestly came at the age of 17 and a half. Right. So my dad said, what the hell you want to go and do? You've got everything here. I said, look, I really want to make my first half a million Indian rupees. The moment I make half a million Indian rupees, I'll be back in Mumbai. And they said, yes, okay. And when I speak to my relatives, my friends, they keep on asking me, still you're not made your half a million? <laughs> so that's the way I started my journey in 1983. Another question before I move on to Mr. Mehta. Do you think it's, it's easier now to do it than it was then? Ramji, you came in 1959. I was born in 1959. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, you know. 100 years ago. So, and I, I, I must be there at your naming ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, whilst we came here, I came here in 1990 and Dubai was a fishing village, almost a sleepy town. And today it's like a bustling, proper metropolis. And it makes everybody proud because it gives everybody an opportunity. I found almost a needle in the haystack coming to Dubai. And I guess that all of you are heroes over here. I know so many of you, and I feel very humbled to be here on this stage and talking about how I came here and what I did. But really, uh, Dubai, the city, has always offered everybody an opportunity. But right now, I think um, times are a little tough. Opportunities are few and far between. And I tell my son, who's all of 28 years old, that if you came in now and started afresh, 
I think it would be much more difficult than it were in our time. I am going to play the recording of this to my wife so that I can tell her it takes time, it's difficult now, nahi ho hai. Koi baat nahi. hold on. But uh, Mr. Mehta, there's a question I want to ask you. So, you know, a, a lot of people say that the big money is to be made in things that regular people don't understand and you got into the petrochemical business. How did you get into that? Well, you know, making money is a lot of uh, chance and luck and a combination of hard work and being in the right place at the right time. So when, when I came here in 1990, there were, there were, you know, no barriers to entry. You could come in, you could get the agencies you want, you could do basically what you wanted here and there was opportunity because the internet was not there yet, the fax machines had just come and the world was a big, 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 big universe. Today the world is uh, a minuscule of a second. What happens anywhere else, you know it in milliseconds. So really there's no opportunity of trade. There's no trade imbalance. We are living in an oversupplied world. So you have to be extra smart. You have to really find those niches which are few and far between. And it's becoming harder and harder. It is. Okay, thank you for those words of wisdom. Uh, I'm going to move to the next generation now. So Ruchi and Adil. Uh, so you guys have actually, you know, gotten into established businesses from your family. So I am not going to ask you what are the advantages. We know what the advantages are. I want to know what the challenges are. Ruchi, we'll start with you ladies first. What are the challenges when you step, you know, have to step into such big shoes? I think uh, like the biggest challenge would be to, to gain the recognition, to gain the respect of the employees. So what I did was initially when I joined, I joined at the shop floor. I went to the factory wearing my safety shoes, interacting with the employees, getting their buy-in. That's how like, uh, it's basically leadership by example. That's how I started my business. That's very interesting. Adil, what about you? Um, good evening, everyone. I just want to first of all thank uh, Forbes uh, for selecting me part of the panel. As you said, I feel extremely lucky <laughs> sitting over here with so many established uh, people over here. So thank you for uh, thinking uh, of this of me. Uh, challenges, um, you know, like she mentioned as well, um, one of the biggest challenges you face as a young, young entrepreneur joining in a well-established company is that you already have a lot of people uh, in the company who are senior, who have been there for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, who are running the company and then suddenly the chairman's son comes in, you know, so what happens then? Um, you know, he, so there's this kind of a small threat factor, a little bit of insecurity feeling, but luckily for me, my dad, he put me into work since I was young, so he put me, my first three years were in the warehouse, then I worked in the marketing department, so I, I kind of grew into the position I am in today, and so that, that helped a lot, but I think the biggest challenge was making sure you don't um, supersede who's or the core guys who built your company, and at the same time, go along with them, because like she said, team is what comes first. So if your team doesn't respect you, how are you going to move forward, right? So I think that was the challenge I faced. Wonderful, wonderful, that's great. Adil, also there's one more thing I want to ask you. So, you know, there's always that first day at work. So when, when people go to other offices, their parents tell them, do this at office, do this, say this to your boss. What did your father tell you when you were going to office for the first day? Listen. Listen, listen, learn. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. You know, as a new person, you're young, you're fresh. I mean, you have buzzing with ideas. You, you want to do so much. But I think the most important thing initially is you need to just understand what's going on in the market, figure out what, what is it that people want, what is it the company's uh, thing. And my thing was I wanted to first attack and figure out what is the worst thing in the company. Where are we losing money? Where are we not doing well? So I, I always believe you should never go and uh, spoil a, a, a running, a, running a, a successful formula. But as a young person, you want to make some changes. So I found the place, the department in the company that was not making money. And there I tried to figure out what are the different small things I can do to eventually turn that around. So I think that's the first thing I did uh, when I joined the company. So that's an intelligent son of an intelligent father. Well done. Fantastic. Ruchi, I'm going to move on to you. Uh, you know, the business that you stepped in is established. It has its own way of going. And when you come in with newer ideas, what did you do? Do you, do you try and change things? Or do you just go with the flow and say, okay, this is the success formula. I'm not going to apply my mind. I'm just going to do it. Yeah, that's an interesting question. What I did was I, I first looked into the business. I just used to go to the factory floor and see what the employees are doing, see the production that's going on. And then I gave them targets and showed that like, with the implementation of lean methodology, we improved the production by almost 40%. Once the production was up to mark, then I decided to expand our value-added steel products, and I introduced new ranges. 
I built the catalogs, cold called a lot of clients, got some orders. Then again, I had to go back to the factory to meet the production demands. So I think um, the main thing is the, to get into the basics, to understand what is done in the, at the shop floor, and then move forward at the upper levels. Fantastic. So start from the bottom, one step at a time. Great. So there's one question now I want to ask all uh, three leaders. We're going to start with you, Mr. Mehta. When was that point in your life when you thought, yes, I've made it? <laughs> that feeling? Well, you know, in um, 1990, when I was coming from Bombay to Dubai, and um, I was saying goodbye to my father. My father was a very proud and very self-accomplished person, and also a very big patriarch. And, um, you know, he, when, you know, he, he was um, very overwhelming and very overpowering. And I wanted to make my future outside of him. And I said to him, I said, Dad, it's very difficult to grow under you. And, and I think that that's a problem. And hence, I'm going to go sideways and come out. And he said, are you out of your mind? You're, I, I have a sister, so I'm the only son. And he said, you have, I have this business. It's a small business. And he says, who's going to run it? And what are you talking? You're not going to Dubai. And I said, no, no, I really have to do it because I, I need to succeed and I, I need to win. And I won't win uh, under your umbrella because I feel suffocated. So I came to Dubai and he said, well, when am I going to see you? And he said, I said, when I make my first million dollars, I'm going to see you. He said, well, that might take a long time. <laughs> and I said, I don't know. If it takes a long time, then it takes a long time. And I'll only see you when I, when I make my first million dollars. I saw him in 19 months. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. Mr. Baksani, I'm going to ask you a question now. Was there a point in this long journey of yours where you felt that's it? At some point where you wanted to just give up? No, no, I never uh, have thought of giving up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I, I feel that nobody in life should give up because e even if you are tired, when you think that you are almost lost, you still think that you have already reached and you have to still, I mean, you have to move a little bit. I, I, I have never given up and I will, uh, I will never say that's it. It's never say die. B brilliant. That's fantastic. Yeah. Mr. Bhatia, last question to you. You've got to tell me, is there anything that you've done so far, and if you had a chance to redo it, would you do anything differently? I, I, I heard what Mr. Yogesh Mehta said and Mr. Ram Bakshani said. Every individual in this part of the world, or particularly in Dubai, gets an opportunity. And what I did 20 years back, if I try to do, I will not be able to succeed. I have done everything with the instincts, and I believe that's the best thing to do, and I will never regret what I do, and I want to do it much better way. Whatever we have taken a decision, or whatever I have managed so far, I am happy with it, and I'll keep on continuing doing that. That's wonderful. God bless. God bless on that note. One question to the two youngsters on stage. Now, same question to um, both of you. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned so far while you're, you're uh, into your business? I mean, one thing I've learned is the biggest constant in business is change, uh, especially in today's world, like, you know, Yogesh Uncle just mentioned. Uh, technology is changing at such a fast pace. And now this is a beautiful thing, but at the same time, uh, it can also get businesses outdated if they don't act fast enough. We've seen the likes of companies like Kodak, uh, like Nokia, uh, who were, you know, just not a few long, not a very long time ago, they were at the top of the industries. Um, you know. Today's world is that of uh, the smartphone. This, today's world is out of the smartphone. So everything is about the apps. What's what's next? Everything's about milliseconds. The largest uh, advertising company today is Facebook, and they don't uh, own a single billboard. Right. The largest uh, car, car company today is Uber, and they don't own a single car. The largest uh, hotel uh, company today is Airbnb, and they don't own a single room. So what I'm trying to get at is, I think today it's very important for us to really step back and really think that how can we join the technology and how we can adapt our different businesses with this technology 
because if we don't, then you know, because uh, you, you see in the US as well, the entire retail uh, complex is happening. Thousands of stores are shutting down today. So I think all of us should really look into our business model and figure out what technology can we adapt into our business so that we can move forward and we can join in this huge technology today. So that's very what I've important. learned. Absolutely, very, very important. Ruchi, the same question to you. What's the biggest lesson you've learned? Yeah, I think I would completely agree with you. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to be innovative, like what he said. But I think it's also important to get diversified into your business. Like, just don't uh, stick on one particular product. For example, we are into steel, but then we diversified into lubricants, into retail, into real estate. So there are some avenues of business who will always be there to support you when there's a financial crisis. Let's say there's a, um, a retail crisis. Then you have real estate. If you have like a, an oil crisis, oil prices are dipping, then you have steel to fall upon. So it's important to diversify. That's why like, uh, even in our company, we are doing forward and backward integration, but we are also diversifying into various other fields. Thank you very much, ladies and um, gents, for joining us on stage. Thank you very much to Mr. Ram Baksani, Mr. Bharat Bhatia, Yogesh Mehta, Adil Sajjan, and Ruchi Dhana. Have a good night, ladies and gentlemen, and all the best to everybody.